Hello, and welcome to the sixth chapter of our Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe read-through. I'm Jem, the reader at St John the Baptist Parish Church in Beeston, and this time we're going to be looking at the chapter Into the Forest, running from I wish the MacReady would hurry up and take all these people away, said Susan presently, until Great Scott, said Peter, I hadn't thought of that, and no chance of dinner either, said Edmund. So as in previous episodes, I'm going to be just talking about the things that struck me or made me think about this chapter. Uh, in this chapter, the Pevensey children go into Narnia. They find it's all true. They go to uh, Mr Tumnus's cave, find that it's been wrecked, and there's a, a notice up from, the, uh, from Morgrim, the head of the secret police. They are then led by a robin deeper and deeper into the forest. So we start then with the children huddled in the wardrobe. I wish the McCready would hurry and take the, all these people away, said Susan presently. I'm getting horribly cramped. And what a filthy smell of camphor, said Edmund. I expect the pockets of these coats are full of it, said Susan, to keep away the moths. There's something sticking into my back, said Peter. And isn't it cold, said Susan. No, you mentioned it. It is cold, said Peter. And hang it all, it's wet too. What's the matter with this place? I'm sitting on something wet. It's getting wetter every minute. He struggled to his feet. Let's get out, said Edmund. They've gone. Ooh, ooh, said Susan suddenly, and everyone asked what was the matter. I'm sitting against a tree, said Susan. And look, it's getting light over there. So they're obviously realising that they're in Narnia. And I, I paused on that because having talked at the end of the last episode about those there's like gothic quality uh, of this novel. I think it's reiterated here again. I'd suggested that Mrs MacReady is a figure who seems to want to keep the house as a museum, to keep it frozen in time, and the children are bringing uh, life to it. Here I think we have a, a moment of transition where they start sitting against uh, the wardrobe, you know, a wooden artefact, and there are these fur coats around them, crucially filled with camphor, mothballs, to keep the moths away, um, because they've been stored up and they're never used and they're uh, part, of the, part of the remnant uh, of the life that used to happen in this house. And, of course, what the children do is put them on and go off into Narnia and bring use them properly, bring life to them. Um, so the, the camphor struck me as an interesting note. There are, there are very few wasted words in this novel, very few wasted details. We'll see that when we get to the uh, subject of the flowers that are mentioned blooming when spring comes. And here I think the detail of the camphor is significant. It's another significant detail when the children put the coats on. I never thought of that, said Sue. Of course, now you put it that way, I see. No one could say you'd bagged a coat as long as you leave it in the wardrobe where you found it. And I suppose this whole country is in the wardrobe. They immediately carried out Susan's very sensible plan to put the coats on. The coats were rather too big for them so that they came down to their heels and looked more like royal robes than coats when they had put them on but they all felt a good deal warmer and each thought the others looked better in their new get-up and more suitable to the landscape. We can pretend we're Arctic explorers, said Lucy. This is going to be exciting enough without pretending, said Peter, as he began leading the way forward into the forest. And there are two detail details there I want to pick up on. First, the idea that Lucy said, oh, we, you know, we, we can play this great game, we can pretend we're Arctic explorers. And Peter calls to her attention the fact that they are Arctic explorers, or the equivalent of that, in that they are setting off across an unexplored landscape are covered in fur and not sure what's going to happen when they get there. And that, again, few wasted words, the coats were rather too big for them so that they came down to their heels and looked more like royal robes than coats when they had put them on. This novel is full of little mentions or sort of pre-echoes of things that are going to become significant later. Uh, and, of course, the, the children putting on coats that look like royal robes is a reminder or a whisper of the fact that they are destined to become the kings and queens of Narnia. There's already been uh, a mention of the possibility that Edmund might become a prince and that the others might be his courtiers. But we have a sense here of the, the true destiny um, of these children, that they're, they're dressing up in their fur coats, but they're dressing up in what will actually become their destiny. They're, they're, they're looking accidentally as if they're wearing royal robes. However, before they put the coats on, perhaps I should have mentioned there's a, there's a notable little exchange here. And now there was no mistaking it, and all four children stood blinking in the daylight of winter day. Behind them were coats hanging on pegs in front of them snow-covered trees. Peter turned at once to Lucy. I apologise for not believing you, he said. I am sorry. Will you shake hands? Of course, said Lucy, and did. And now, said Susan, what do we do next? Now, 
there, I think, in an extremely English school child tale is a, a moment of forgiveness. Um, there is a moment of repentance forgiveness where Peter realises he's wronged Lucy, he's called her a liar, He suggested that she's a, a fantasist, and, and crucially, he said he, she's been lying to him, and he has the strength of character and the, sort of the, the moral uh, righteousness to say, I'm sorry, and crucially, to ask her to shake hands. This, I think, is the equivalent of asking for forgiveness. He's, he's asking to, to be reconciled to her, um, which, of course, is uh, an important trope, both in the, in the Old and New Testaments. You know, before you make your sacrifice, go and be reconciled to your brother, in this case, reconciled to your sister. Uh, he says, before we go any further, I need to admit that I'm wrong. I need to, to, to repent, and I'd like you to forgive me. Now, on the next page, Edmund gives himself away. I say, began Edmund presently, oughtn't we to be bearing a bit more to the left, that is, if we're aiming for the lamppost? He'd forgotten for the moment that he must pretend never to have been in the wood before. The moment the words were out of his mouth, he realised he had given himself away. Everyone stopped. Everyone stared at him. Peter whistled. So you really were here, he said. That time Lou said she'd met you in here, and you made out she was telling lies. There was a dead silence. Well, of all the poisonous little beasts, said Peter, and shrugged his shoulders and said no more. There seemed indeed no more to say. And presently the four of them resumed their journey, but Edmund was saying to himself, I'll pay you all out for this, you pack of stuck-up, self-satisfied pricks. Now, this, I think, is, is a deliberate parallel with the scene where, on the previous page, Peter very straightforwardly says, I'm really sorry, will you forgive me? Peter realises Edmund has done wrong, but then cuts it off. Doesn't give Edmund the chance to ask for forgiveness or to make restitution, um, there's a really interesting moment there where he says that there seemed nothing else to say. That phrase is going to occur later, also around the, the questions of sin and forgiveness and repentance, when it's used of um, people talking to Aslan and there, and there seeming to be nothing more to say. Here it's used, I think, to imply that the, the process has been stopped. And later, Peter will blame himself for this. He, he, he doesn't say directly, but he says something like, Aslan, oh, I'm... I was angry with Edmund, and I think I helped him go wrong. There's a moment here where, you know, Peter isn't totally blameless. He, Peter's role seems to be uh, leadership and, and you know, to be the high king, to be, to be the head of the family or the leader of the family. And he's been keen to keep the family together earlier, even at the expense of, of what Lucy sees as the truth, where he says, oh, it's a, it's a hoax, it's a joke, you know, we, we all need to admit this and, and settle down to normal life. Here in the extraordinary life of Narnia, he perhaps should be giving them a chance to to exchange repentance and forgiveness, but he doesn't. Um, he lets his own feelings cut that off, and it's a it's an interesting moment of moral complexity. I think there's Peter is not as one note as, as we might sometimes be be tempted to see him. He he makes a genuine mistake here, and Edmund is, if not sinned against, not allowed to go through the same process that Peter has has gone through, even if he wouldn't have done so. And it's, again, the striking insight into Edmund's character that he says, I'll pay you out for this, you pack of stuck-up, self-satisfied prigs. Prig is an interesting word. I think it implies a level of duplicity, of hypocrisy, as, as acting if you're better than you actually are. And once again, Edmund has imputed double motives to other people, probably because he's so aware of, of duplicity himself and assumes that other people are acting like that. So the moral development of the, of the children continues at this point. When they go through the snow... They arrive uh, here into the little valley and at last to the very door of Mr Tunis's cave, but there a terrible surprise awaited them. The door had been wrenched off its hinges and broken to bits. Inside the cave was dark and cold and had the damp feel and smell of a place that had not been lived in for several days. Etc, etc, etc. The crockery smashed, the pitcher has been slashed, um, there appears to have been uh, a fire lit... What's this, said Peter, stooping down. He had just noticed a piece of paper which had been nailed through the carpet to the floor. Is there anything written on it, asked Susan. Yes, I think there is, answered Peter, but I can't read it in this light. Let's get out into the open air. They all went out into the daylight and crowded round Peter as he read out the following words. The former occupant of these premises, the fawn Tumnus, is under arrest and awaiting his trial on a charge of high treason against her imperial majesty Jadis, Queen of Narnia, Chatelaine of Caer Paravel, Empress of the Lone Islands, etc., also of comforting her said Majesty's enemies, harbouring spies and fraternising with humans. Signed, Malgrim, captain of the secret police. Long live the Queen. Here, I think, 
one of the, the threads of the novel we've been tracing comes again into sharp focus. This is a war novel. Um, it's a novel both about the, the the Second World War, but also the situation of living under totalitarian rule. Um, it's the first mention, I think, of not quite the first mention of a spy, but the first mention of the secret police. Narnia is not only a land magically locked into winter, it's a land in which a Gestapo-like or a Stasi-like secret service uh, surveil and oppress the people. Um, and earlier I mentioned, and perhaps it seemed a bit obsessive, I mentioned that Edmund makes a sort of moral mistake when asked who he is, a question about his identity. He says, oh, I was at school, or I was, it's now the holidays. And I suggested that for Lewis, identifying yourself with an institution, with a system, is a moral mistake, it's a moral flaw. Um, it's, it's buying into the idea of systematising the world and planning utopian or idealistic visions of humanity which turn into totalitarianism. Here I think we catch the same hint of that in the style of the words. The former occupant of these premises, the form Tumnus is under arrest, etc. There's this bureaucratic tone to the, the language. What they've done is beaten him up, smashed his house and taken him away to probably to be executed but they refer to him as the former occupant of these premises. At this stage, Hannah Arendt hasn't written her classic work on the banality of evil, uh, her study of, of the totalitarian uh, situation in Nazi Germany, but I think there's a, there's a touch of it here, the sense in which terrible crimes and horrors are committed with the language of institutional administration. Um, they're, they're carried out um, in that very bureaucratic tone of voice. As I say, that it's, it adds a, a moral and an emotional shading to the novel. This is, this is clearly a novel that is not only written in the shadow of the Second World War, but in, in the late 1940s, when there are still tyrannies of this particular kind taking over and ruling whole chunks of Europe. Lewis is very aware of these, not only as ideological enemies, but as nation super, supranational states that are currently uh, oppressing and and terrifying their citizens it's also striking that the, the the message ends with long live the queen possibly a bit speculative again but given that the nazi regime was so so keen to begin every conversation end every conversation with the the greeting or the uh, valediction heil hitler it's striking here that Malgrim instinctively signs off his letter with a reference to the name of Jadis, uh, Long Live the Queen. So having seen the wreck of Tumnus's house, the children see a robin and, for some reason, Lucy talks to it. They were all wondering what to do next when Lucy said, Look, there's a robin with such a red breast, it's the first bird I've seen here. I say, I wonder, can birds talk in Narnia? It almost looks as if it wanted to say something to us. Then she turned to the robin and said, Please, can you tell us where Tumnus the fawn has been taken to? And as she said this, she took a step towards the bird. It at once flew away, but only as far as to the next tree. Then it perched and looked at them very hard, as if it understood what they had been saying. And Lucy thinks the bird wants to lead them somewhere, and she persuades the others to follow it. And as they're following it, on the next page, Edmund says to Peter, he's worried that they're following this bird, even though they don't know that it's definitely on their side, it could be leading them into a trap. He then says afterwards, well, and how do we know that the side we're apparently on is the right side? You know, how do we know that the witch isn't the rightful queen? That's a nasty idea, said Peter. Still, a robin, you know. They're good birds in all the stories I've ever read. I'm sure a robin wouldn't be on the wrong side. And I instinctively agreed with that, and I wondered why I did. Partly, I suppose, because I associate robins with Christmas. They appear on Christmas cards, a tradition I believe that goes back to the fact that postmen were known as Robin Redbreasts when they were bringing Christmas cards in the Victorian period, though that may be uh, that may be a folk etymology. And then I tried to remember another situation where Robin had led people somewhere, and I came up with the Secret Garden. In fact, chapter eight of the Secret Garden, when I looked it up, is called the Robin that led the way, and uh, it leads the main character to the key to the Secret Garden. And then the next day, we have this scene. She stopped with a little laugh of pleasure, and there, lo and behold, was the robin swaying on a long branch of ivy. He had followed her, and he greeted her with a chirp. As Mary skipped towards him, she felt something heavy in her pocket strike against her at each jump. And when she saw the robin, she laughed again. You showed me where the key was yesterday, she said. You ought to show me where the door today, but I don't believe you know. 
The robin flew from his swinging spray of ivy onto the top of the wall, and he opened his beak and sang a loud, lovely trill, merely to show off. Nothing in the world is quite as adorably lovely as a robin when he shows off, and they are nearly always doing it. Mary Lennox had heard a great deal about magic in her eye of stories, and she always said that what happened almost at that moment was magic. One of the nice little gusts of wind rushed down the walk, and it was a stronger one than the rest. It was strong enough to wave the branches of the trees, and it was more than strong enough to sway the trailing sprays of untrimmed ivy hanging from the wall. Mary had stepped close to the robin, and suddenly the gust of wind swung aside some loose ivy trails, and more suddenly she jumped towards it and caught it in her hand. This she did because she had seen something under it, a round knob which had been covered by the leaves hanging over it. It was the knob of a door. Now, I hadn't expected such a, a specific parallel. I'm not necessarily suggesting that Lewis cribbed that scene. Um, but when Peter talks about all the stories, um, I did wonder whether there's a slight influence or something something in Lewis's mind there of a, a Robin leading someone specifically to a door. Because, of course, the, the story in The Secret Garden is about her discovering this secret garden that's been shut up for years and hasn't been allowed to bloom properly, hasn't been allowed to sort of fulfil itself as a, as a garden. There hasn't been a proper spring there for years. And she's shut up in this great big house where there are all these rooms. You see what I'm getting at. <laughs> There's a real series of parallels between these two novels particularly in the area that I've been banging away at, the idea that there's a gothic tinge to this novel, because The Secret Garden has obviously undoubtedly got that, that gothic framework. There's a small, pale child in a great big house full of unexplored rooms. Uh, at night, when she's trying to sleep, she hears a voice on the wind sobbing and, and crying, but everyone says, oh, no, that's, uh, that's nothing. You don't want to pay any attention to that. And it turns out that actually there's someone sort of shut up being ministered to in this house. This is, A, clearly a rewrite of Jane Eyre in some sense, one of the classic Gothic uh, novels of the, of the 19th century. And also, I think there's a touch of The Hound of the Baskervilles, or the same themes, I should say, as The Hound of the Baskervilles, that the sound of, of a, a voice sobbing in the night in a great big uh, mansion. There's also, I think, a, a sense in which it's a novel about that goes from the Gothic to new life, rather like The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. There's such a stress in The Secret Garden on the generative power of plants and seasons um, and the, 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 the somewhat embarrassingly at times rendered dialect of the Yorkshire people, which I, I was lucky there was none of it in that scene because I'm not sure how I would pronounce it, uh, persuasively at least, is not unlike, I think, some of the dialogue of the beavers that we're going to meet soon, the good, honest country people who are in, in tune with this land and who are waiting for it to, to sort of spring to life again. Um, uh, it's striking in the secret garden they use the dialect word quick, uh, a northern dialect word for uh, things that are lively, things that are alive. But that has two echoes for me. First of all, in, in the fact that it's an Anglo-Saxon word, uh, quick, C-W-I-C, as it's usually uh, transliterated. So it's a very old word, a very ancient English word. But also it's a prayer book word um, when it comes again to judge the quick and the dead. There's that religious, uh, even mystical sense um, of the, the coming of new life. Uh, and the springing up of the spring, which tinges very strongly the secret garden. And I think we can feel the same impulses and the same uh, associations clustering around that parallel scene uh, in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. So I, I continue my argument that this is essentially a Gothic novel in some sense. Uh, and that's the end of our discussion of Into the Forest. Next chapter, chapter seven, uh, runs from while the two boys were whispering behind, both the girls suddenly cried, oh, and stopped. Is entitled A Day with the Beavers, and it ends with the words. That's all the better because it means we shan't have any visitors, and if anyone should have been trying to follow you, why, he won't find any tracks. So, if you'd like to add your ideas and your thoughts in the comments, I'd really like to read them. Um, I'm, we're nearly, in fact, I think we're over a third of the way into the book here, and I'm aware that I'm picking up on my own hobby horses, my own particular obsessions about this novel, so I'd really like to hear what you're thinking about it. So do leave your comments, and I'll talk to you next time.